Welcome back to the second part of our discussion of the 1920s. You will recall in our last lecture when we discussed World War I, known at the time as the Great War, the horrific loss of life in Europe, as well as by Americans who had gone to, to fight late in the war. Many, many young people in the United States, as well as Europe, became very cynical after the First World War, and they were referred to as the lost generation. They said, well, the Great War, or World War I, had been fought for the idealistic reason of ending all wars, as President Woodrow Wilson had said, but clearly that didn't happen. Look at the death and carnage. And a number of famous writers of this generation uh, had this belief. F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, and many others really lost faith in the basic underlying values and institutions of Western civilization. A number of them left the United States, went to Paris where they congregated, and they, they went to the bars and drank because also they were not allowed to, to drink legally in the United States. Now, F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote a famous novel at the time, The Great Gatsby, which focused on a self-centered, egotistical young man who seemed to be always drunk. Perhaps you read that novel in your high school English classes um, or you've seen the movie. <coughs> now, the first half of um, this lecture, I discussed the Jazz Age, the flapper women, but most Americans were really shocked by this. That did not represent the views of most Americans. <coughs> they thought this was very frivolous. They thought jazz was immoral. They viewed the flappers <laughs> people as cultural rebels, and they felt that the country was quickly descending into social turmoil and chaos. And again, we had a strong conservative reaction to, to the, uh, the flappers and, and jazz and whatnot. And, and this, we'll, we'll see in a minute, led also to immigration restriction. And this group, which represents the majority of Americans, they blamed the radicalism of the period, which was not reflected in the White House since the presidents during this period were conservative Republicans, but they blamed the social radicalism on the different ethnicities living in the cities and what they viewed as foreign ideas such as socialism, communism, and anarchism. There was a strong tendency for many of these for what's known as nativism. By nativism, they felt they the descendants, Anglo-Saxon descendants, Protestants, represented the real Native Americans, and all these other immigrants were somehow alien and going to destroy it. There was a lot of fear, a lot of prejudice against the new immigrants who were from outside Western Europe. We discussed this earlier in the course, that the so-called new immigrants were from Southern Europe, uh, were Catholic, Italians, or Jewish from refugees from Russia. And this led to a strong tendency for what's referred to as militant Protestantism. These were Protestants who felt <coughs> they had to take action to restore traditional Christian morality. And this was focused against Catholics, Jews, and many others. Also, after World War I, this nativist uh, feeling led to a great amount of xenophobia. Xenophobia uh, means dislike of foreigners or foreign things. 
the state of Nebraska, for one, prohibited the teaching of any foreign language. And in fact, one state legislature in Nebraska was reported in the media as saying, the English language alone was good enough for Jesus Christ, and it's good enough for the people of Nebraska. Now, if you think about it, of course, Jesus Christ did not speak English. Of course, the Christian Bible that this Nebraska state legislator was referring to, the Bible he read, was in English. But as we know, also, the original Bible was, was, was not in English. But this was the attitude. There have been many more immigrants from South and Eastern Europe, as we saw earlier in the course where we talked about the new immigration. And from Eastern Europe, it also included Poles. Roughly 150,000 Mexicans had come into the United States. Um, some, as we saw during our discussion of World War I, they, many had come in, had been recruited to come in the U.S. to replace the soldiers who had gone to the war. Now it reached the point where about half the men in factories, the white men in factories and mines, were immigrants. And it's true that a small number, a very small number of immigrants were indeed violent socialists. They were very proud of that. They, they felt that they needed to stir up violence in society in order to overturn capitalism. Or they were anarchists. Anarchists, you'll recall, refers to people who believe that there should be no form of government. And they did use violence for political goals. <clears throat> now this anti-foreign, anti-new immigrant attitude resulted in Congress passing in 1924, the Immigration Act. This capped the number of immigrants coming from Europe to 2% of the number of European immigrants from that country in the 1890 census. It's very important to note that's 2% by country. And the purpose of this was to reduce European immigration from places like Italy, Greece, and Eastern Europe. This is a political cartoon from the time supporting the Immigration Act of 1924. It's entitled, The Only Way to Handle It. At the bottom, we have immigrants coming out of the small end of a funnel into what you know says USA. And there we have Uncle Sam with a gate saying that they could only be several percent of those who came in. At the large end of the funnel, we see masses and masses of people from Europe who want to come into the United States. Now let's turn briefly to non-European immigration. You'll recall that the Japanese have been excluded um, from 1872, the Ex Exclusion Act, Excuse me, the Chinese have been excluded since 1872. The uh, China Exclusion Act, that had been renewed in, of course, 1882. We saw that earlier in the course. But now they also banned immigrants from China. But in marked contrast, virtually unlimited immigration was allowed from throughout the Western Hemisphere. And for that reason, people from Mexico, from Cuba and Puerto Rico became by far the fastest growing ethnic minority in the U.S. Many of the Cubans went to the Florida area, the Puerto Ricans tended to go to uh, New York City, and people from Mexico went um, to nearby areas in the United States, such as California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, although a good number of Mexicans also went up to Chicago because of the jobs available there. It's very interesting that the, the Hispanic immigrants, while not totally accepted, were much more socially acceptable uh, 
And one good example is from the early 1950s, the famous I Love Lucy television programs. Um, you may have seen reruns on late night TV. They're available on YouTube. They're quite funny. In which you have Lucy, who's a redheaded angler woman, falls in love and she marries in real life, it's true. Uh, Ricky Ricardo, who is a band leader from Cuba, uh, speaks with a sort of speaks English with a Cuban accent and makes funny jokes mispronouncing U.S. words. This was, by the way, the by far the most popular television program in the early years of television in the United States in the 1950s. And before uh, starring in this TV show, um, Lucy's husband, Cuban husband, uh, Ricky Ricardo, had actually been a very famous band leader. But while many Hispanics were socially acceptable in that sense. We have to remember there was still discrimination against them. And in fact, here in the state of Texas, Hispanics generally were not allowed in white schools until the 1950s. And in 1954, there was an important Supreme Court decision regarding a Hispanic child, um, Hernandez, uh, who, who was barred from a white school and the U.S. Supreme Court decided in 1954 that he could attend a white school. That, of course, is the same year as the famous Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Topeka Board of Education, uh, involving black students. We'll talk about that later in the course when we get to the 1950s. There were, I might note here, some school districts in Texas that did allow Hispanic students to go to school with white students, um, some areas of Austin, San Antonio, etc. Now the Sacco and Vanzetti criminal case was by far one of the, the most sensational court case of the decade, criminal case of the decade. Uh, and that involved two Italian immigrants by the name of Sacco and Vanzetti who were very proud of being revolutionary anarchists. Before they were arrested, everybody knew that, that they said that they wanted to foment violence and they wanted to, to have massive uprisings in the United States. In order to do that, they, they needed money. So they stole money from a shoe factory and in the process, they killed a guard and an employee of the factory. Uh, they were found guilty. Many people to this very day uh, think that they were, they were not guilty and that they, people, some people on the far left uh, have long viewed them as martyrs of capitalist injustice because they wanted to steal money from a shoe factory and use that for the poor. <clears throat> now let's look again at the Ku Klux Klan. Actually, in this course, we haven't discussed the Ku Klux Klan, which you recall in the first course, um, near the end of the course, you would have read about the Ku Klux Klan being formed in the Southern states after the Civil War, when the Southern states were controlled by the, United, the Northern states, the U.S. Army, during the so-called era of Reconstruction from the end of the Civil War in 1865 until 1877. Now the Ku Klux Klan was formed at that time essentially to keep the blacks in line. The blacks were no longer slaves. They had the right to vote uh, from amendments, but the whites wanted to spread fear and panic among the black population. And also, as you would call the Ku Klux Klan or KKK, at the time also tried to terrorize uh, northerners who went down in the reconstruction process. Well, that Ku Klux Klan really faded by the end of the 1870s and ceased to exist because there was no need for it. With the end of reconstruction in 1877, the, uh, nor the North 
ceased to exercise direct control of the South. Of course, the South remained in the United States, but Southern whites in the Democratic Party took control of all the political institutions in the South, all the, all the courts, and essentially were able to impose a very rigorous system of racial segregation um, through Jim Crow laws and other means. Now, however, the Ku Klux Klan was resurrected, started again, and it really started after a famous movie made in 1915. This was the era of sort of the first major silent movies, and that movie was entitled The Birth of a Nation, and the nation refers to the Ku Klux Klan. This movie was the first movie ever shown in the White House. President Woodrow Wilson, you recall from our discussion of World War I, a very, at the time, considered liberal, progressive, idealistic president. He'd been president of uh, Princeton University. He showed it in the White House um, to his guests, and he thought it was a wonderful movie. Now, it's a very, very racist movie. It portrays the Ku Klux Klan as coming in near the end of the movie and saving a white family, which is in a home. And in the movie, they have a group of blacks outside about to uh, break into the home and clearly kill all the whites. So I, in the module, there is a link to um, a movie that's been uploaded by someone else on YouTube. And I encourage you to see the last 10 minutes of the movie and pretend you're back in your time machine at this time. And as outrageous as it seems today, people were literally cheering in the theaters uh, when the Ku Klux Klan, you know, rode in on their horses in their white um, outfits with the hoods and saved the white family. So. This is a famous book by Thomas Dixon in 1905, The Klansman, Historical Romance of Ku Klux Klan. He wrote this about the Ku, in 1905 about the Ku Klux Klan after the Civil War, and people started reading this and saying, gee, the Klan, you know, many people thought, oh, the Klan was not as bad as they had heard. This is an ad for the movie The Birth of a Nation by D.W. Griffith. And the movie really became a big hit throughout the United States. And what's important to realize at this time, not just in the South, and I'll talk about this over the next few minutes, the original Ku Klux Klan after the Civil War was only in the South. Now the Ku Klux Klan spread throughout the United States, and in fact, most of the members were not even in the South. Here we have a movie theater in Portland, Oregon, in the northwestern state of Oregon, with uh, the opening of the birth of the nation in Portland, Oregon. You see members of the Klan riding out in their hoods in front. Um, and this is from the theater. This is like the advertisement from the theater. And I indicated in red um, what they said was, it will make a better American of you. In other words, watching the movie. Remember, this is not in the South. This is in Portland, Oregon, where there are very few blacks living. And I'll explain in a minute how the Ku Klux Klan, the resurre resurrected a new Ku Klux Klan, the main focus was not necessarily on blacks, but on other interests. <clears throat> this is Atlanta, Georgia. This is Stone Mountain. It is actually the largest solid stone in the world. And this is where the new Ku Klux Klan was organized, as it says here, on midnight, November 25th, 1915. And on the right, the, you have Colonel Summons. He was the founder and the imperial wizard. That meant that he was the head of the Ku Klux Klan. So it was resurrected in Atlanta, Georgia, but then the um, Klan spread rapidly, rapidly throughout the United States. <clears throat> it was nationwide. 
it believed in 100% Americanism as defined by the KKK, white supremacy, and nativism. So it was against all the new immigrants coming in. It continued to be against blacks, but it was also against the concept of Darwinism, the whole, I will talk about this more in a few minutes, the belief that evolution could move beyond the animals to include humans. And it was also against the whole concept of evolution in the animal kingdom. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. They were against the modern tendencies in the 1920s. They were against jazz music. They were really against flappers. They were strongly anti-Catholic because Catholics were not Protestants and the old belief that Catholics were not loyal Americans because their first loyalty was not to the United States, but rather to the Pope. They would call Catholics Papists. They were strongly anti-Jewish. They were against communists, socialists, atheists, prostitutes, and were against illegal liquor. Um, they felt that the consumption of uh, liquor should be illegal. Again, to emphasize, the focus was no longer on the blacks. They certainly were racist, but did not like the blacks. But that was only one of the things that they did not like. <laughs> in fact, they were strongest in the areas of the country where there were relatively few or absolutely no blacks. For instance, rural areas in the Midwest, by this I mean Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio, California, and Oregon. And just to give you an idea of this anti-Catholic nature of the KKK and its influence, the state of Oregon banned all Catholic schools. And in 1928, the Democratic presidential candidate, Al Smith, was Catholic and the Ku Klux Klan made a major, had a major issue to defeat Al Smith because he was Catholic. And there were people who did not, not members of the Ku Klux Klan who also opposed Al Smith because of his Catholicism. <clears throat> Near us in Richmond, Richmond, Texas, just south of here, um, you, there was a large Ku Klux Klan. And here you can see a photo of the initiation ceremony in 1922 of initiation new people into the Klan. Here we have that same group in Richmond. During the 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan paraded openly. Here we are in Washington, D.C. with the U.S. Capitol in the background. The man in the front is waving an American flag. Here we have another view of a different parade another year in Washington, D.C. So the point is you can see how openly they, uh, they marched. In. And here's another. This is in Washington, D.C. This is a view taken from right at the back of the White House along Pennsylvania Avenue, and that's the U.S. Capitol in the background. And this is just an example of one of their pamphlets, America for Americans. Now, during the 1920s, at its peak, the Ku Klux Klan had over 4 million members. And that included six governors who openly paraded as Ku Klux Klan members in their robes and three United States senators. Now, the Ku Klux Klan sort of crumbled and ended when the Grand Dragon, uh, one of the major leaders, was convicted for kidnapping and rape of a young white girl. Now let's talk for a few minutes about religious fundamentalism. These were people, there was a major conflict in the 1920s and it continued far beyond that, of religion versus modern tendencies. And the real flashpoint was Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. 
which of course is inconsistent with a literal reading of the first chapter of the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, in which God, according to the book of Genesis of the Bible, created the earth and all its plants and animals, uh, including humans, in seven days and nights. <clears throat> a major player in this was a William Jennings Bryan. Three times he was a presidential candidate. We discussed him in this course in the 1890s, being the Democratic uh, candidate. He was from the populist power, a very, very eloquent speaker. And he felt very, very strongly on the literal truth of the Bible, the book of Genesis. And by literal truth, that every word is true. So yes, the earth and the plants and animals were created in seven days and seven nights. And he said there's impossible to have evolution because all the plants and animals were created at that time. So they didn't, you know, the plants and animals evolve into other species. Well, this came to its head in the very, very famous Scopes so-called monkey trial. Now, this is, took place in the state of Tennessee, in which the state of Tennessee had prohibited the teaching of evolution in public schools and colleges. I might note that there are several counties in Texas and other states, or school districts, rather, in Texas and other states, that today... Um, prohibit the teaching of evolution in uh, biology classes and insist on teaching um, the uh, book of Genesis uh, interpretation. So what happened in the Scopes trial is John Scopes was a high school science teacher. He was actually a substitute teacher and he substituted and he purposely taught a class on evolution because he wanted to get arrested. So he went in, substitute teacher, taught a class on evolution uh, using Charles Darwin's theory. And he let people know he was going to do this because he wanted to be arrested to have a test case. Because he had hoped that the courts would throw out and, um, the Tennessee law prohibiting teaching of evolution. So that's called a test case. He wanted to be arrested. So this became a major worldwide media event. There were reporters from all over the world outside the courthouse. Um, they had the telegraph and the radio at this time, and so news was flashed several times a day on who was saying what. It became known as a monkey trial. Why? Well, people who opposed the teaching of evolution said it's ridiculous. Evolution teaches that humans are are descended from monkeys and apes. So actually became known as monkey trial and there were many, many people outside the courthouse selling to the spectators a uh, toy monkey, not, not real monkeys, but like stuffed animal, children's type of monkeys. And there were many people who went to, to witness the trial. <clears throat> this is a photo of uh, one of the attorneys at the trial. As you can see, it's quite hot. It's in Tennessee in the summer before the days of air conditioning. <clears throat> now, there were two extremely famous lawyers at the trial, and this really generated a lot of media attention. William Jennings Bryan, whom we discussed a few minutes ago, volunteered to represent the state of Tennessee in prosecuting Mr. Scopes. So even though he didn't work for the state of Tennessee, he was not the district attorney or anything, he decided he would represent the prosecution. And everybody in the state of Tennessee was delighted, and the state government was delighted because William Brennings Bryan, William Jennings Bryan was a, a very articulate speaker. Clarence Darrow, was already the most famous defense lawyer in the United States. He traveled down to Tennessee. Uh, he didn't live there. He traveled there because he thought it was, this was an important test case. Now, what happened was William Jennings Bryan 
claimed he was an expert witness on interpreting the Bible because Clarence Darrow said, you know, he'd like to speak with an expert witness. And Brian said, I am, I'm an expert on the Bible. So under very intense questioning from Clarence Darrow, William James Bryan agreed that yes, it's absolutely true that Jonah was swallowed by a whale and lived to tell about it as described in the Bible. That yes, Joshua made the sun stand still as described in the Bible. That yes, there was a great flood and Noah's Ark with, you know, a male and female of each species. That, that, that's in the Bible, that's exactly true. And then Clarence Darrow turned to Brian and said, is it true that Eve was really created from Adam's rib? At this point, William Jennings Bryan, who was getting quite old, he was tired from the heat, he didn't know how to an answer that, he stumbled, and, and he sort of said, well, that may not be exactly what happened. And then, so that ended his defense that everything in the Bible was true. <clears throat> well, because he couldn't answer the last question, Brian's reputation was totally destroyed. Now the jury, which was 12 local farmers, uh, found Scopes guilty and uh, the judge levied a fine. But as it turned out, the fine later was waived on a, a legal technicality. Now, the issue of evolution, particularly the teaching of it in schools, is still hotly debated in the US today, as I, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. If you haven't already seen it, <clears throat> I encourage you to watch the movie Inherit the Wind uh, about the trial. It's a, it's a dramatization. Uh, the most famous version was the 1960 version uh, starring Spencer Tracy, but um, there have been two or three other versions since then. I think the, the latest version was about 15 or 20 years ago. Now let's turn to prohibition. Prohibition of alcohol. This resulted from really an alliance between small town and rural Protestants and the urban political progressives from the people who viewed that they were progressing and especially educated women. This was the first feminist political cause, it was prohibition. And as I mentioned earlier in this course, for many, many women, prohibition of alcohol was a more important issue than their getting the vote, even though of course they wanted to get the vote. Now, World War I, or the Great War, as it was known at the time, they had encouraged people, the government encouraged people to drink less. So the grain that's used to make alcohol could be used for food. So that helped because people thought, well, yeah, we're wasting a lot of food by producing alcohol. Also, the fact that, as I mentioned during our discussion of World War I, most of the beer brewed in the United States was brewed by German Americans who um, brought over the techniques from Germany. And so people had actually boycotted beer some in World War I. <clears throat> now this is an ad from women who wanted to prohibit the sale of liquor. Help me to keep him pure, the little baby. Please vote against the sale of liquors. Now, in 1920, the 18th Amendment was, was ratified, and actually prohibition was instituted not by an amendment to the Constitution, but by a law, the Volstead Act. And just I make, make a note, it was not necessary to pass an amendment to the Constitution. There was nothing to change or amend in the Constitution. The Constitution didn't mention that Americans had the right to consume or, or buy or sell alcohol. So the Volstead Act was actually passed before the 18th Amendment uh, took effect, and that's when prohibition started. 
And this is one of, example of one of these cases where many times people want their issue included in an amendment to the Constitution because they think it becomes more permanent. Modern examples, last 20, 30, 40 years, have revolved on the highly, highly controversial issues of gay marriage or abortion, where neither of those issues, of course, are directly mentioned in the Constitution, but people feel um, by having an amendment, it, it makes the, the side that they're in favor of, whether pro or, or con on those two issues, more permanent. So in any event, the Volstead Act was passed, and then the 18th Amendment was passed by Congress, and it was ratified by the needed three quarters of the states. The whole prohibition experiment lasted 13 years, and everybody concluded it's a major and costly failure. Now, I think it's important. Most people think, well, prohibition prohibited the drinking of alcohol. It did not directly prohibit the consumption of alcohol. That was not illegal. Only manufacturing alcohol for sale, selling it, and distributing it was illegal. So there were loopholes. There were ways to get around this. For instance, there was a one-year period before the law became in effect. During that period, you could stock up. So if you enjoy drinking whiskey, and you know one year from today, whiskey will be illegal. Well, what would whiskey drinkers do? They go out and spend all their money, borrow money, to fill up a whole room in their house with whiskey bottles. Farmers were allowed by the law to ferment fruit to preserve it. Because farmers said, well, we have a lot of fruit after the harvest, and the one of the ways we do it is we ferment it. Of course, during this one year grace period, farmers filled up barns with um, alcohol made from fermented fruit. The law provided liquor for medicinal purposes with a prescription from a doctor. And during the 13 years of prohibition, tens of millions of prescriptions were written by doctors for specific alcohol like Jim Bean whiskey, etc for supposedly medical reasons. Churches were still allowed to buy wine for religious services. And so you had some priests and ministers, you know, filling up huge rooms with bottles of wine, which clearly were not just for the religious service. <clears throat> because home manufacturer of making your own liquor was not illegal. It was only illegal to manufacture it for sale. Many people started brewing beer at home. And in fact, stores would sell the needed ingredients for beer in a box and you take it home and make your own beer or wine. Same thing for wine. Now, particularly easy to make at home is what's called bathtub gin. Gin is a alcoholic, drink with a very, very high concentration of alcohol. And so what people would do is the formula called for like putting, making a lot of it and people would do it in their bathtub. So it's called bathtub gin and they put all the ingredients in there and that was totally legal and you could buy the ingredients openly. Also, it was very easy, easy to smuggle liquor in from Canada and enforcement had almost no effect. There were an estimated 32,000 illegal bars in New York City and many more thousands in other big cities. Um, they were called speakeasy. A speakeasy because there was a door with a little hole in it. You'd knock on the, on the little door and, some, and you were supposed to speak and say the password to get in. Now, prohibition was effective in closing bars in the rural areas, the small towns, where there was massive support for prohibition. But even President Warren Harding, a conservative Republican, served illegal or what was called bootleg liquor in the White House. And he told the newspapers, 
this isn't a great moral issue. I don't know what all the fuss is. Now, I mentioned a moment ago bathtub gin. Uh, this is something you can buy on the internet if you want to have for a party. It, that uh, metal container is supposed to represent your bathtub. And in the back, the sign says, bathtub gin, gin, take a cup. Now, this is a political cartoon uh, in the ran in many newspapers that supported prohibition in the 1920s. And what it's doing is it's saying booze, of course, is the informal word for liquor. And the, the people dressed as barrels of liquor or bottles of liquor. And the, at the very front, it says the Hun Rule Association. Hun was, was an old Germanic, you know, ancient Germanic tribe. And here what it's saying is, uh, you know, Huns are ruling or, or the Germans are in charge of the country. To the left, it says, we make people poor, we cause poverty and crime, we are against progress, da, da, da. We fill penitentiaries and asylums. So this is an advertisement in support of prohibition. Not an advertisement, a political cartoon that would be included in newspapers that supported prohibition. And those would largely be in small towns and rural areas. This is uh, before the vote on prohibition of Congress, which gets your vote, mother or the saloon, vote dry, and dry their mean against uh, alcohol. This is a postcard from 1910, at which time you recall from earlier in the course, we saw that a number of states had already um, outlawed alcohol. Here we have the brewery making beer over and the shadow of it is going over the home. And this is a parade in the city encouraging people to vote dry. <clears throat> and one of the means for smuggling it in was taking uh, military torpedoes, taking everything out, filling them with bottles of whiskey, um, and then throwing them off a boat, and they would float to the beach where the people's accomplices would, would pick them up. Well, the, ma the net result of all this was there was massive political and police co corruption in every major city in the United States, and organized crime um, ran many of these cities. Al Capone, who was, of course, a world-famous Chicago gangster, really was viewed as a hero by many people in, in Chicago and elsewhere. He became so wealthy, he provided free food to Chicago's poor, and he publicly defended bootlegging, which is the distribution of illegal alcohol. He said, it's a simple business. I'm just supplying the market's demand. I'm not forcing people to drink. And Capone also told a group of newspaper reporters, when I sell liquor, it's bootlegging and illegal activity. When my patrons, or in other words, customers, serve it on a silver tray on Lakeshore Drive, this is an expensive area in Chicago, it's called hospitality. So what he's talking about is what he sees as the real hypocrisy here. And he was finally convicted and went to prison, not for violating laws on the manufacture, sale, or distribution of liquor, but rather tax evasion, because he had made so much money and he had not paid taxes. Now, prohibition ended after 13 years in 1933, when Congress repealed the Volstead Act, which was the legal basis, and then also passed the 21st Amendment to the Constitution, uh, which uh, ended prohibition. By that time, it was an obvious failure. Liquor was widely available. Uh, it had led to massive crime rings. 
and also in 1933, as we'll see in the next class, was during the Great Depression, and the federal government desperately needed tax revenue uh, to fund programs uh, to hire the unemployed and other social programs. And so a fairly easy way to generate tax revenue was to make the sale and consumption or the sale of liquor legal because then as now there is a very high tax on um, the purchase of liquor. Well, thank you very much. And in the next class, we'll move on to the Great Depression.